under correction is a common occurrence after LASIK. Although in the bed retreatment is an overall effective and safe procedure, in some eyes it can lead to serious complications. Whereas this OCT shows an excellent case for a conventional enhancement, in this other case the residual stroma layer is not thick enough to qualify for further ablation of the stromal bed despite showing an apparently adequate post-operative central corneal thickness too. Further thinning of the residual stromal tissue in this cornea would lead to post-enhancement ectasia. In fact, an increasingly large number of reports are describing catectasia after in the bed LASIK retreatment. When faced with a post-op LASIK patient who is undercorrected, but who also does not have enough residual stroma to perform a conventional enhancement, what are the options? Radial keratotomy is easy to perform, but decreased corneal integrity and late onset hyperopic shift may presumably appear as real problems in the medium and long term. Intercorneal rings may be a good alternative from the biomechanical and functional point of view, but they are not available at every laser surgical center. PRK or LASIK may be done after LASIK, but the occurrence of post-operative haze is rather significant. With the same laser unit, one would perform a conventional retreatment running the risk of future keratectasia. But my approach consists in ablating the undersurface of the LASIK flap whenever the flap is thick enough, because the stromal component of the flap does not contribute to corneal tectonic integrity as much as the stromal bed does. After performing this technique on a series exceeding 40 eyes with a mean follow-up of two years, I have never encountered keratectasia or any other serious complication. In undersurface ablation of the flap enhancement, the flap must be thick enough to be deemed suitable. It is well known that the epithelial layer thickens after myopic LASIK. In fact, previous studies have shown that the epithelium has developed a maximally reported compensatory hyperplasia of 110 microns. Bowman's membrane is usually less than 15 micron thick in the human eye. In addition, the stromal tissue should be thick enough to admit a greater real than predicted ablation of a flap stroma due to a generally longer retreatment time and consequent stromal dehydration. With all this in mind, in order to avoid ablating through the disc into the Bowman's membrane, which can lead to wrinkling of the Bowman's layer with significant loss of best spectacle corrected visual acuity, free on the surface ablation of the flap thickness should allow for a residual cap thickness greater than 150 microns after subtracting the intended ablation depth. The surgical technique is started by marking the peripheral cornea. With this specific undersurface ablation of the flap LASIK marker, a 5mm optical zone is delineated over the entrance pupil. A pararadial mark helps in correctly aligning the flap under any circumstance. Additionally, radial marks in the 180 degree meridian are performed with the instrument, which are to be aligned with the horizontal axis of the operating microscope aiming reticle. The optical axis must be carefully marked in every undersurface ablation of a flap surgery. A flap roxis technique is then used to elevate the flap. The procedure is continued in eyes with pachymetrically proven insufficient stromal bed and adequate flap thickness. At this stage, a specific instrument, the posterior ablation platform, is thoroughly moistened with unpreserved artificial tears to provide a lubricated surface and to increase the surface tension for enhanced smoothness of the flap stroma. 
The exposed stromal bed is covered by a particulate-free LASIK shield to avoid the most peripheral ablation of the transition zone. With a hand that is not holding the posterior ablation platform and with the aid of a blunt angled instrument or a blunt tip LASIK spear, the flap is outwardly flattened over the convexity of the platform to resolve faults. After accurate centration of the laser aiming beam on the marked visual axis, the full refractive correction is administered with an optical sound of 5 mm. Ablation of the stromal portion of a flap instead of on the stromal bed involves mirror pattern delivery of the laser treatment. Since the spherical ablations are 360 degrees symmetrical, they need no final transformation. However, the formula beta equals 180 degrees minus alpha was developed to calculate new axis orientation, which is beta, for toric ablations on the flap stroma. In this formula, beta is the axis on which the surgeon treats the underside of the flap and alpha is the eye's actual axis of astigmatism. The application of this formula leads to no effective change in toric ablations at exactly 90 degrees. Similarly, a toric ablation for a negative cylinder at exactly 180 degrees requires no final change. Conversely, toric ablations for astigmatism at any other orientation different from 180 degrees and 90 degrees need modification. For example, given a negative cylinder at 30 degrees, the ablation should be programmed at 150 degrees, which results from subtracting 30 degrees to 180 degrees. In this case, the astigmatism axis 5 degrees is subtracted from 180 degrees, so that 175 degrees is the axis on which the underside of a flap is treated. The LASIK posterior ablation platform improves the ease and quality of the procedure by achieving a more stable eccentric eye fixation that otherwise would be sometimes difficult to obtain. Also, the convexity of the platform is devised to match the normal corneal curvature and to provide smoother surface for ablation. Otherwise, the difference in curvature between the center of the cornea, which is steeper, and the limbus and the sclera, which are flatter, explain the tendency towards wrinkling of the upwards exposed flap stromal surface. The laser-treated flap is then repositioned on the receiving corneal bed. The inner face is irrigated to remove debris. The flap is then painted into position with a wet and soft metal salt sponge. The replacement of the flap is assured to be extremely precise and the flap is allowed to settle for at least 2 minutes to ensure optimal adherence. The results of the undersurface ablation of a flap LASIK retrievement technique in terms of safety and efficacy are at least as good as those of the conventional enhancement technique if the appropriate instrumentation is used. Moreover, whereas in the bed retreatment in normal corneals typically induces an increase in the posterior corneal elevation, this is a typical delta map of the undersurface ablation of the flap technique in corneas with insufficient stromal thickness for bed retreatment showing no significant post-enhancement change. For this, the undersurface ablation of the flap retreatment technique should be considered a better alternative in these eyes. In conclusion, on the surface ablation of the flap represents a new useful surgical aid in LASIK retreatment of low myopia and myopic astigmatism whenever adequate flap stroma exists, which offers a reduced risk of developing future keratectasia.